Uh, hi everyone, I'm Ani. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Sherbrooke where I work with um, David Poulin. Today I'm going to be telling you about a project that I've been working on uh, with David to perform uh, fault-tolerant gates on a certain class of quantum LDPC codes. Before I get started, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the chance to speak here, uh, and I'm very excited to be uh, presenting my work to you. Okay, so um, part of my motivation, of course, has become redundant because we've heard about these uh, topics a lot over the past few talks, but um, I'll, I'll try and keep this short. So typically when we think of uh, quantum error correcting codes, we think of codes such as the surface code or the color code where we encode a single qubit into n qubits. The drawback, of course, is that the cost of encoding a single logical qubit increases as we increase the block size. Um, the class of codes that I'm going to be talking to you about today are capable of encoding uh, k qubits into n qubits, where this parameter k scales with the block size. So the cost of encoding any given logical qubit uh, decreases as you, increases the block, as you increase the block size. There's a sort of wholesale effect um, that you get as you buy more physical qubits, um, uh, and the price of any given logical qubit becomes cheaper. Okay? So um, like the surface code, uh, Quantum LDPC codes only require uh, sparse parity measurements, so if you were to consider both the data and ancilla qubits, then re regardless of how big the block size is, any given qubit is only going to be connected to a fixed number of other qubits, and therefore the hope is that they'll be easy to engineer and perform measurements on. Of course, we sh I should mention that low density parity check codes already exist in the classical literature, as, um, as was pointed out by the previous speaker, um, and uh, Technology such as Wi-Fi already takes advantage of, of these codes. In the quantum case, of course, um, the, the drawback with LDPC codes is that the qubits are not necessarily going to be nearest neighbor. The ones that are connected to each other are not going to be next to each other. And as we know, there's this bound by Ravi Poulan and Terhal, which says that if we wish to construct a computer on a tabletop, then the uh, surface code morally captures what we need to know about code parameters. There's only so many qubits that we can pack into this space uh, before we lose the ability to protect them. Okay, so, so these codes um, sort of necessitate long-range couplings, um, you know, but, but this isn't inherently a problem. There may be architectures where uh, thinking of qubits um, as localized point-like objects might not be the best approximation, so perhaps there are architectures which could, which could take advantage of LDPC codes. The questions that, uh, of course, we're tasked uh, with answering when we suggest an alternative is whether this trade-off is worthwhile. Okay, so um, we've heard a lot about this class of codes um, recently, so uh, as has been mentioned many times, Hypergraph product codes are a class of uh, quantum codes that were discovered by Tillich and Zemore back in 2014. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they're capable of encoding a number of qubits that scales linearly in the block size, and at the same time, their distance is great. It uh, can correct a number of errors that scales as the square root of the block size. Um, in addition, these codes can be equipped there we go. So these codes can be equipped with an efficient decoder called the small set flip decoder, which um, when errors occur randomly can correct a large number of these randomly occurring errors. Um, and furthermore, uh, this decoder is also uh, robust to syndrome noise. Um, and, uh, oops. Finally, uh, there's been some recent numerical work which has been trying to study the performance of these codes um, under, under uh, reasonable noise models, and uh, we've heard about uh, some of these works uh, recently. Yeah. Um, I mean, this still points, it's just, uh, it, I can't change slides from, uh, I think I'll just stick to this, it's okay, I can come back to my keyboard. So, uh, the question, of course, is, um, you know, these, these works have shown that um, uh, hypergraph product codes warrant further research, they, they perform uh, very well. Uh, the next question is, how do we perform logical gates on these codes without propagating errors? So there was a proposal by Dan Gottesman a few years ago where he suggested that we uh, consider block codes 
um, by taking this intuition that we spoke about earlier, where if you encode um, more than one qubit in a given block, uh, by breaking your code into several intermediate sized blocks, uh, you can kind of take advantage of this wholesale effect, but um, it doesn't go the entire way uh, because you break these codes down, as I said, into these intermediate sized blocks. The objective here was to perform gates via state injection, and the size of the ancilla is going to depend on the size of the intermediate size blocks. What we're going to be talking about today is a way to perform gates on these codes by using one single block. Okay. So uh, to summarize what's going to be coming up, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, performing gates on hypergraph product codes, and the way that I'm going to be performing gates is using a fairly general technique called code deformation. Okay. Now, uh, this raises the question, of course, uh, if uh, LDPC codes are hard enough to construct, how do we construct uh, a family of LDPC codes which are somehow adiabatically related to each other um, and at the same time um, somehow preserve this LDPC property which made them amenable to measurements? And what I'm going to show you is that it's possible to generalize defects uh, from the study of the surface code. It's possible to generalize punctures. Um, these objects have fairly natural representations in terms of the hypergraph product. Um, and by doing so, a, a puncture really just carves out a certain portion of your code. Um, and this is going to preserve the LDPC property. Okay. As such, co code deformation, uh, the way that we're uh, that we were initially considering it, is a CSS preserving operation. What does that mean? It maps X type stabilizers to X type stabilizers, Z type stabilizers to Z type stabilizers. And the logical is as well. If we want to perform um, even the complete Clifford group, we need some way of mapping X type operators to the Z type operators. And to this end, I'm going to be generalizing uh, these um, punctures that uh, I'll be talking about to a slightly different kind of defect this defect we, um, we we're going to be calling wormholes, and these serve to break the CSS nature of the code, at least locally, graph locally. Okay, this is a fairly general recipe to perform uh, gates on hypergraph product codes, but for the purpose of today's talk, uh, I'm going to be explaining uh, how this works uh, using the surface code as an example. It's going to help me illustrate these ideas. Um, how does it work? Uh, on the surface code, I can consider punctures on two um, sectors of my lattice which are potentially separated and uh, what this defect does is by using entangling measurements it entangles the boundaries of these two punctures. How does this help? Um, if I were to consider a charge some excitation on the surface of my surface code then if it were to enter the mouth of um, one puncture it's going to emerge via the other. Um, and it's going to turn out that uh, this sort of object is uh, useful and also generalizable to uh, hypergraph product codes in general. Uh, I will point out that this may be of interest to um, those of us studying quantum error correcting codes. Uh, if we wish to ask, uh, how do I get past the surface code which uses only nearest neighbor connections, uh, but I introduce a controlled or small amount of non-locality? Because the amount of non-locality that I introduce in this defect is controlled by the size of the puncture. Okay, so with that, I'm going to dive into the details uh, and start by quickly reviewing um, some uh, classic coding theory. Okay, so uh, when we talk about uh, classical codes, there's different ways of describing them. Uh, one way is, of course, to use the parity check matrix. Uh, an alternative way is to use a, um, is a, is a graph theoretic way of describing these codes in, and is useful when we're studying LDPC codes. Graph-based algorithms um, have, uh, have been very popular, such as the belief propagation uh, algorithm, uh, can be very easily analyzed by thinking of the error correcting code as a graph. So um, with every classical error correcting code, uh, the protagonists of our story are the checks and the bits, and uh, these are going to have uh, visual representations. The checks are going to be represented, I'm going to choose to represent them as square nodes, and the bits are going to be represented as circular nodes. And if a bit acts on a check, then I connect uh, these two objects via an edge. Okay? An LDPC code um, will then correspond to a family of these graphs where every check and every bit is only connected to a constant number of nodes. Okay. 
So uh, here's an example. I, this is a code that we're all familiar with. Uh, here's a repetition code, a three-bit repetition code, and it's got a fairly simple um, uh, factor graph. It's just a, it's just a line. Uh, in this case, I've chosen to index my variable nodes um, by numbers and my checks uh, by uh, uh, small Latin letters. Okay. So um, why are hypergraph pa hypergraph product codes interesting? They're interesting because, uh, in general, it's difficult to construct quantum LDPC codes where um, we'd like to maintain the low degree of both qubits and checks while at the same time enforcing the commutation relations between the stabilizers. Unlike the classical case, uh, random constructions don't suffice, and therefore we need to find alternative ways to construct quantum LDPC codes. So some of the most famous LDPC codes, such as the surface code and the color code, they resorted to topology. Um, but as pointed out earlier, these, uh, these codes have some restrictions. Hypergraph product codes, on the other hand, um, they eschew topology in favor of um, graph theoretic or algebraic description, and this is what gives them their power. So let's see how these codes work by considering the surface code as an example. Okay. So this hypergraph product code construction has to give you a recipe to, to um, given, given this classical factor graph, it has to tell you, okay, how do I get my qubits? How do I get my checks? And here's, here's how the recipe works. Um, so here's, your, here's the cheat sheet. If it says that if, if you take two variable nodes, and if you consider their product, so let's look at this corner right here, take two circular nodes, and the product is a qubit. Uh, it's a circle-circle node. And uh, likewise, I could consider a qubit that, um, uh, that's defined by two check nodes. So it, it says there, there will emerge two types of qubits, one of variable, var variable type, and the other of check-check type, and these are denoted as circle-circle and square-square nodes. Okay, so those are the, uh, the qubits, and of course, naturally, the other types of nodes are going to define the checks. Uh, and you can choose a convention where uh, if, the first, if the first node is a variable and the second node is a check, um, such as this one, then it's going to define an X-type stabilizer, and the alternative uh, is going to be a Z-type stabilizer. The connections between bits are just going to be inherited from the classical code. So if we fix our attention on bit three, then that layer itself is merely a repetition code and it's repeated uh, for, for every bit and check node. Okay, and it turns out that this object, you can work it out, uh, corresponds to the three by three surface code, a small patch with um, smooth boundaries on top and rough boundaries on the side. Uh, in general, I could repeat this recipe with more complicated types of codes. So uh, I'd first list the types of nodes that emerge by uh, using this product recipe to understand what emerges. And then I'll just inherit the connections that come from my classic code. Okay. Um, what's nice about this uh, construction is that the, uh, that the commutation relations uh, manifest themselves naturally, uh, and in this case, there's this uh, butterfly relation that emerges uh, between X and Z type nodes. It says that if an X type stabilizer and a Z type, Z type stabilizer were to meet once on a VV type qubit, then, the, then they're going to have to meet on a CC type qubit. So these two types of qubits uh, force these uh, stabilizers to commute. Okay? Okay. So um, we're going to use a technique to perform um, uh, logical gates, and this is called uh, code deformation. And what that entails um, is, is, is it starts with the code that you're provided, and then it performs a series of elementary operations on this code um, uh, in order to um, uh, modify this code and take it to uh, some path in the space of all codes. Um, each of these steps to go from C1 to C2 or C2 to C3, all of these steps are going to be elementary operations so that you can um, piece together this global operation by small operations which you can guarantee are fault tolerant. If you don't change the code much in any given iteration, then you're not going to, um, then you can guarantee that you can correct uh, errors that occur. In each of these uh, operations, I can perform uh, these fairly simple um, operations, I can measure new stabilizers, I can stop measuring old ones, or I can measure new gauge operators and stop measuring old ones. And ultimately, um, the deal is to get back to the code that I started with, and uh, hopefully, I've implemented a non-trivial logical operation. The way that I've uh, set it up 
we map poly operators to poly operators, so in total we're going to hope, uh, at best we're going to hope uh, to get a non-trivial Clifford operation. Okay? So uh, an example that most of you are probably familiar with, of course, is braiding. Um, what happens here? So we've got, we've got two types of punctures. We've got smooth punctures and rough punctures. How are these objects defined? Uh, we carve out certain portions of our code. So here, uh, black circles would de could denote uh, smooth punctures and white circles could denote uh, rough punctures. And what defines these objects um, is I carve out a certain portion of my code such that if I were to consider the boundary between the portion that's been carved out and the outside, the rest of the code, uh, for a smooth puncture, it's defined such that no Z-type stabilizers straddle, straddle the boundary of my code. So no, no Z-type stabilizers are broken. Uh, on the other hand, um, X-type stabilizers could potentially be broken, okay? Uh, likewise, a rough puncture has the opposite property where no X-type stabilizers are going to be broken along the boundary, whereas uh, Z-type stabilizers could potentially be broken. These objects are capable of encoding qubits, and furthermore, you can perform a logical operation by braiding um, um, the, the punctures around each other. And this one example in the, this is going to be my uh, you know, punchline slide. It's going to contain all the information that you need to take away, all the information that you need to remember. Okay, what does it say? It says that a puncture itself can be composed as the hypergraph product of two subgraphs of your code. So if you take two smaller patches of your code and consider the hypergraph product of that, then uh, it, it, you can obtain a puncture. So uh, as, as I mentioned, a smooth puncture is defined as um, um, some, sub, some portion of your code where uh, if you look at a boundary, no Z-type stabilizers are broken across the boundary. If you're looking at it for the first time, there's probably too many details here for you to see that it is indeed the uh, uh, X-type stabilizers that are broken and not the Z-type, um, but uh, you, can, you can work it out uh, once you know uh, how this object is set up, okay? So there are certain boundary relations on the smooth type puncture uh, that define it, and it turns out that uh, these boundary relations can be uh, imposed on the quantum puncture by, s by imposing certain boundary relations on my classical codes. So if you demand that I consider these classical codes such that there's no check type nodes on the boundary of my first code, and no variable nodes on the boundary of my other code, then it's possible to show that this object is not going to have Z-type stabilizers on the boundary. And what that means is that Z-type stabili st Z stabilizers are not going to be broken when I carve out that portion of my code. Okay, um, so here's the boundary and you can check that uh, Z-type stabilizers are not going to be incident to this object. Uh, in general, I'm going to be I'm going to require um, something a little more, uh, I need some more notation to describe what's coming and it's going to be convenient to describe these objects in terms of uh, this repetition code that uh, we've, we've already seen before jumping to uh, something more complicated. Okay, so how do I select such sets with the good types of boundary relations? I'm going to ask that um, I, on my first code, I'm, uh, in order to define a smooth puncture, I'm going to select some set T it's some set of check nodes, and I'm going to consider its entire neighborhood. By doing so, uh, I'm guaranteed that everything on the boundary is going to be a variable check node. And likewise, uh, the on the other side, the, the main actor is the set S, so it's a set of variable nodes, and I'm going to consider um, all of its neighbors, and therefore on the boundary, I'm going to have only check check nodes. The other type of, uh, so N here denotes the neighborhood, and it's any, any node that interacts with the variable nodes in S. Likewise, I can also consider the ancestor set to S, and these are nodes which, when I consider their boundary, they give you S, okay? Um, and uh, it, using these types of sets, it's going to be uh, possible to um, define punctures in an algebraic way, okay? So wh what was the main advantage of using, a, uh, of using the hypergraph product? Uh, rather than resort to topology, I was able to express everything in terms of algebraic or graph-theoretic objects. And now, 
by using these sets, um, subsets of variable nodes, its neighborhood, and its ancestor, I can continue in the spirit of the hypergraph product code and talk about these defects and punctures entirely in terms of either algebraic or graph theoretic objects. Okay, so here's a cartoon of a, of a factor graph where um, I've got some set S, it's a subset of variable nodes, and I consider any any set of check nodes that's connected to it and that's going to define a neighborhood. And likewise, uh, its ancestor is defined as the, as the set of nodes where all of the neighbors uh, map to S. Um, and I think this is the only equation that I've got today. Uh, smooth punctures are defined as follows. If you were to consider these algebraic sets, uh, uh, it's, sorry, if you were to consider these uh, graph theoretic objects, then it's possible to define algebraically uh, following the same hypergraph product relation, um, it's possible to define the Z and X type relations using the hypergraph product formalism. HT in this case denotes the projection of the parity check matrix onto the subset T. Um, IS is the projection onto the, uh, the set S. And by composing the products um, um, as shown, you can consider, you, you can construct the, the puncture. I'm not going to get into the details, but um, what, what's qualitatively different here from the surface code? First of all, as you create a puncture and you increase the size of the puncture, it turns out that these objects on a hypergraph product in general will contain more qubits as the size of the puncture increases. And uh, typically the number of qubits uh, will scale as the size of the boundary of the puncture. Not all of these logical qubits will be created equal. Some of them will be good logical qubits and have high weight, and others will not. And um, we're, going to be have to be, we're going to have to be careful when we perform code deformation. For the purpose of today's talk, I'm just going to tell you how to define and set up these uh, defects. I'm not going to get into the details of the deformation itself uh, in the interest of time. Um, you can, using the algebraic uh, definition of the logical operators, which um, follows in a straightforward manner from the algebraic definition, the punctured themselves, you can also uh, then deduce the distance associated with the logical operators that emerge. Okay, so, so far we've talked about how we can create punctures and as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we have to have some way of breaking the CSS nature of the code even if we just want to complete performing the Clifford group. And to this end, we're going to be using, um, uh, uh, we're going to be starting with certain kinds of uh, defects called twists, and here's how they work on the surface code. Suppose I were to consider a plaquette and a star type operator, operator that were adjacent to each other. Um, then if I went ahead and performed an X type measurement on the support of my plaquette operator, then it'll anti-commute with this plaquette. Likewise, if I performed a Z type measurement on the support of my X operator, then it's going to anti-commute. If I consider the product, if I consider the product of these two measurements, then it anti-commutes with both of them. And the way that I'm going to resolve this anti-commutation is by replacing these two stabilizers by, their, by this hybrid. I'm going to replace them by their product. So this now defines one stabilizer, okay? Uh, this object now serves to break the CSS nature of the code, at least locally. And uh, what's important is that by doing so, uh, we still have, um, uh, operators of low weight, so uh, the weight doesn't explode. Okay, so um, how this is typically used is to measure these two body operators along a defect line and it creates these hybrid stabilizers, the ends of which um, are called uh, twist defects and uh, they can be used as an accessory. If a charge were to enter one side of this defect, then it emerges via the other side having changed type. Um, but. Uh, in addition to being used as a mere accessory, they can also be used to encode qubits in their own right. Uh, and you can use pairs of these objects to uh, encode logical qubits. And by making analogies with um, uh, Majorana fermions, uh, it's possible to show that if you were to exchange uh, twists, then you can perform single qubit Clifford gates on, uh, on the qubits uh, encoded by these twist defects. Okay, okay so uh, that's great. Um, and we searched for some time if we could try and generalize these twist defects into the hypergraph product code as well. Unfortunately, the problem is that when we consider twist defects on, uh, when we define twist defects on a surface code, we take advantage of symmetries of the surface code and some properties which are very particular to uh, uh, codes that emerge from this line-like graph, okay? So for instance, um, 
when you consider an error chain, there's only two defects that appear on either end. Uh, the, the, there are these neat line-like defects that you can consider, but on the other hand, if you were to consider an expander code or an expander graph, the number of syndromes that appears scales with the size of the error chain, and this messes things up, and it's unclear how to generalize uh, line-like defects in a straightforward manner. Okay, is there an alternative? The alternative is going to be to piggyback on a defect that we've already defined, the puncture type defects, and see if we can break the CSS uh, nature of the code along the puncture. Um, and in this way, uh, we can generalize these defects and break the CSS nature even on a hypergraph product code. How are we going to do this? Well, rather than consider uh, nearest neighbor, uh, rather than consider stabilizers that are right next to each other, we're going to consider plaquette and star type operators which are uh, separated. And uh, I'm going to go through the same exercise, okay? So I have a plaquette and a star type operator, and I'm going to go ahead and measure an X, X and Z type uh, measurement on their support. By doing so, uh, these objects are going to anti-commute with uh, the stabilizers that they are incident to, uh, and I'm going to replace them by their product to resolve this anti-commutation relation. This breaks the CSS nature uh, of the code, and I'm going to show you that it do, it, it, you can use these objects to break the CSS nature on a puncture. Uh, and the difference uh, between what we had before and what we have now is that these uh, that this measurement, this two-body measurement, could now be performed on two spatially separated regions of my code. Uh, importantly, however, um, five? Yeah, okay. Um, so this yields hybrid stabilizers whose weight is independent of the size of the puncture. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to go ahead and perform, uh, once we start with uh, a smooth puncture or a rough puncture, we're going to go ahead and perform these two-body measurements all along the boundary of these uh, objects, and this yields, um, uh, here's a cleaner version of what we're seeing here. Uh, this yields uh, two punctures that are entangled. Their boundaries are entangled. There's no qubits on this mesh. This is just added for visual effect. Um, and um, <coughs> that's how you create a wormhole on a surface code. Uh, how do we generalize this to um, uh, hypergraph product codes? Well, uh, we're going to be defining what we call a symmetric construction of a wormhole. So in this case, it's a simple thing to do. You consider two products uh, of a one graph G. So you know that every element has a corresponding element in the other graph by definition. Um, and I, I defined um, smooth and rough punctures using some subsets S and T. Um, and I'm going to use the same types of objects to create both the rough and smooth punctures on these graphs. Uh, and then I can go ahead and perform uh, entangling measurements between um, partners in either graph, and this yields a fairly straightforward procedure to create hybrid operators. Excuse me. Um, following uh, the recipe of what was laid out before, you can find that there exists an algebraic expression for the stabilizers of, uh, of your wormholes, as well as the logical operators um, corresponding to a wormhole. What do the logical operators look like in the case of the um, in the case of the surface code? Well, uh, here's one way of encoding two qubits. Um, one logical operator is is something that we're already familiar with. Um, it's simply a loop type operator that um, encircles one of the punctures. Uh, and similarly, on the other one, equivalently, this this stabilizer is equivalent to a. So if we said these were Z type operators that encircle the mouth, you can consider X type stabilizers that encircle the other mouth. Uh, those, those two would be equivalent. The conjugate logical operator, if you call this the logical Z, then the conjugate logical operator is a string um, of one Z type and one X type that terminates on both boundaries. Okay, so um, that's, th that's all I have to say. Uh, there's of course more you could say when you consider the uh, action of code deformation itself, but I don't have time for that today. Uh, but I told you how to uh, define these uh, defects um, in uh, when you define hypergraph product codes, of course, uh, you'd guess that you can move punctures around by changing either the subcode that you've selected on graph one or graph two, and by doing so, you can move punctures around and think about generalizing uh, braiding as well. Um, and uh, because we've only removed edges from uh, starting from an LDPC code, we preserve the LDPC property because the weights of these stabilizers and qubits don't increase. Um, we had to introduce these wormholes in a way to break the CSS nature of the code in order to be able to perform all gates. Um, 
but we had to be, uh, we had to find an alternative route uh, because we couldn't directly generalize twists. Um, and in order for you to complete a universal set of gates, you're going to have to require a state injection by into this block. All right, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. Questions? So, sorry, did you say that with the wormholes you could do the whole Clifford group, or do you yeah. need, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe this is a slightly similar question, but you say you can do a universal gate set with state injection. Does this imply that you have some general way to find the gates you can perform by braiding these wormholes? Um, if you give me a certain braiding operation, I can tell you what logical operation that implies. But if I were to start with a general code, I am not providing you with a recipe to compile gates. Okay, but from two general wormholes, you can find the general braiding operations that you get. Yeah. How uh, do you do that? Brute force. Okay. Right, so uh, right now I don't have a way to tell you here is exactly what you have to do to perform. You can work backwards and say that if I did this, then it's possible to verify whether or not it's a trivial or non-trivial logical operation. I'm not going the other way. Okay. Uh, I have uh, thoughts on that, but we can talk about that. Yeah, thank you. Our thinking about uh, fault-tolerant gates and surface codes has evolved over time from first being transversal gates between surface code patches like the pan pair of pancakes yeah. to then braiding punctures inside of a large surface code. Right. And now a lot of people think about lattice surgery where it's almost yeah. holographic and you just deal with the boundary. Mm -hmm. um, seems like you're on the second step of this uh, evolution <laughs> in the LDBC process. So right. a natural question is to ask, what are the prospects for the third step uh, going to lattice surgery with these kinds of uh, codes? I'm not sure because, well, there's there could be potentially several logical operators that live on the boundary. How do we, uh, I don't know. Okay, yeah. thanks. So to define a single uh, hole, you'd use two sets on uh, each of the classical codes. That's right. So to define a pair, you just cut them out separately, right? So you don't have two sets on the left code and two sets of cuts on the right hole. No. So no, you define them separately, but you still have the correct, uh, the correct hypergraph. So it will not technically be a hypergraph product code that's anymore. Right. A okay. punctured code is no longer a hypergraph product. That's right. But so you can get it by adding two hypergraph product codes okay. together. 